Hello everyone and welcome to Marsden Mondays and back by popular demand we have Mr. Michael Grombine. Welcome back Mike. <laughs> Thank you Matthew. I see all three of my friends called called you and told you to have me back on so uh <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a, you know, after both of the sessions that we've had, one on Tolkien and the other one on uh, the Crusades, uh, people love that stuff. It's amazing. Well, it's, yep. And there's, there's a, there's an appetite for, for a good epic story. And there's an overlap between Tolkien and the Crusades in that regard. They're both epic stories of a, of a kind. And uh, so, yeah, we're, I'm happy to be back. And, uh, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit more about my favorite crusade, which is the third crusade. Um, I know you're not supposed to have favorite crusades, but uh, I do. So sue me. No, we, 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 that is absolutely what we will talk about. But I do want to ask you one other question. Now, yep. I don't know the answer to this yet. Right. So for anyone okay. watching, I don't know. Did you see the Rings of Power trailer? <laughs> yes. Referring to the nerd background behind me. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Not only did <laughs> I see the Rings of Power trailer, but at um, if you go to the one ring dot com, you can see my co-host and my reaction to the Rings of Power trailer, the season two trailer. I presume is what you're talking about. I, I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we did our reaction to it, and it's it's a it's a whole lot of cope. They're they're <laughs> they they wouldn't. They were trying real hard not to um, admit that they had screwed up massively in the first season, and and sort of kind of restart their effort by kind of ignoring you know a whole third of the first season was about the um the not gandalf and and not hobbits um and tribe and they had literally one second in that trailer about those because they realized that they had done such a crappy job of writing that the the not hobbits the harfoots uh culture because they were a bunch of dirty little sociopaths is basically what their cult culture boiled down to um, that uh, that that no one liked them, and so you can tell you can tell what they're responding to in people's reactions to season one, um, in season two. So they're they're really leaning into the whole. This is going to be an epic battle, you know, show, and we're just going to ignore the Harfoots. Apparently, um, I, I'm sure they won't ignore them in the actual season. Um, but yeah, it was it was uh it was not good. It was not good. But uh, if you if if any of your listeners have a Tolkien itch and they want to they want to check us out, uh, that would be awesome. They can check us out on YouTube and or just go to the one ring dot com and see our. Podcast. Yeah, no, they, they absolutely should. And, you know, I think that the the one benefit were with the number one, the destruction of great movies and great stories. Is that people are going back to great stories and to great movies and they're saying, OK, well, I'm rediscovering these things. I'm, I'm, exactly. I'm going back and checking out what the big deal was about them. I mean, it's it's different for us for like Gen Xers that are out there and we like actually read books, you know, when we were younger <laughs> because and we, we actually read them and, and, and felt them. You know, we had those things in our hands and turned the pages. It wasn't just a a um a flick across the screen and, and listen i mean i always had a massive issue with that when um uh, when i get sent scripts I, I love holding a script and reading a script properly rather than watch it, you know reading it on the computer it's it, there's something i don't know i mean it's uh it's part of who we are right totally agree one of the most exciting and this is going to sound super nerdy but since we are talking about a medieval um, subject today when i was in in your uh the land of your birth getting my master's degree i was at the bodleian library in oxford for my final dissertation doing some original research where i actually got to handle the manuscripts from you know in this in my case it was 800 year old manuscripts from the from the 13th century and through the 15th century and having the physical vellum in your hands and it you know, piecing out translations but actually holding that that's the that skin in your hands which was the books of the past it it's such a visceral connection i just my the deepest part of my nerd soul were activated um, <laughs> with, with and, it, and it was it's it's so much better I mean, and you're right about the gen x thing right because we are gen x is the last generation that grew up before the internet there was no internet until we were adults and yeah. and so our our childhood had zero internet in it at all not in, i'm not even talking about smartphones i'm talking about the internet um so so we 
we did have a different experience. Uh, you know, growing up, I was I spent m much of my uh, school years in libraries, reading books, read, reading hundreds and hundreds of books, and of all sorts. And uh, it was it's a different kind of an experience. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I love the digital world. Obviously, I'm I'm a part of it in a variety of ways. I I, <laughs> I build software as one of my things. You know, as a, my in my day job uh, as a businessman, um, but it is it there is something um, very satisfying and real about things you can hold in your hand so i'm with you there yeah yeah i mean i think there's a difference between something that is a tool and something that rules you mm. you know uh, and i think that for many people in this day and age that the internet rules them and it shouldn't it's it's you know it is like crack cocaine at your fingers you 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 have everything and nothing all at once yep. at the touch of a button. Yep. Yep. It's very, it's very funny how that happened. We have more knowledge at you, as you mentioned at the, at our fingertips uh, than anyone in previous history had could ever imagine. And, and most of our concerns are far more shallow and people have along the way, we've stopped considering how, things in depth. We've stopped thinking critically. We've stopped really digging into the the knowledge that it's so easy for us to access so yeah and, so and you know what michael one shallow... of the things yeah and i'm just going to say this quickly then we'll get into the we'll get into the crusades but right uh, i noticed you commented the other day on the um the video that jim burnham did on the uh proof for the existence of an immaterial soul yes, and it's funny because it. so many people think that they can like you know take the cliff notes on philosophy or theology and come up with a coherent argument. You know, there, there were so many people that commented on that, that were clearly, they came across it, you know, whether they were flipping through on the shorts exactly. and they came across it and looked and, exactly. they, and every single one of their arguments was just very, very feeble. And they spoke like they had authority, right? Which was, which was really weird because if you knew anything What's about that subject, you could just dismantle their arguments very, very easily. Right. And it's what it's what the um, knowledge is different from thought. So so facts, I should say, you know, everyone, everyone, there's famous phrases built around the word facts nowadays, but just the mere statements of truth or, or supposed truth of what happened or didn't happen, though, that's just data. And the data, it does not an intelligent mind make. You, you, and so when people, and of course, if you don't have a habit of thinking critically, then you can't determine good data from bad data when you're, when you're talking about it. And so, as you mentioned, very easy to dismantle. Yeah. And these are concepts, not that we came up so, with, they've been thought by the greatest minds of a history, you know? So exactly. it's like, Hey, listen, listen, was, mate, it's not us. me talking. It's Plato, you know, that guy, Plato. <laughs> uh, yep. Anyway, take it up with and, him. Yeah. Take it up with him. That guy. I mean, you know, he'll, he'll never, he'll, he'll never uh, succeed. Willie, that guy, sure. He'll be gone <laughs> anyways. All right. The third crusade. So we've spoken about the, the first little bit about the second. Now let's get into the third crusade. So set the scene for us, Michael. Okay, so Third Crusade, uh, which is called the King's Crusade, because if you remember from my, our last podcast, the First Crusade, which I talked mostly about, was not led by kings; it was led by a bunch of princes and and nobility from mostly um, from uh, actually uh, around Sicily. A lot of a lot of Alsace Lorraine in France, and a lot of Sicilian um, Normans, and and uh, essentially. Um, knights of France and England and Germany who had who had lived in that area, but they were they had become um, their own little princes, and they were the, the leaders. The four major, five major leaders were were um, mostly princes. This crusade's different. So this crusade takes place almost a hundred years later. So uh, Jerusalem was taken successfully in the first crusade in 1099. So basically at almost exactly the year 1100. In the um, ensuing century, or 88 to 90 years, um, 
that it didn't settle the issue. So there were these crusader states called, they call the group of them Outremer, but these are the five crusader states that were set up, these, these crusader kingdoms in the Middle East. And um, they were contested by the Muslims for continuously after the taking of Jerusalem until they were finally um, reconquered by the Muslims ultimately a few hundred years later. In this first century after the first crusade, there had been a second crusade when the first of the crusader uh, states fell, the crusader state of Edessa, it was called. And um, this was in between Antioch and Turkey or southern Turkey near Armenia. And uh, the second crusade, which had taken, which took place in the uh, 1140s, so almost 50 years after the first crusade, was unsuccessful. So it, it mostly failed. The second crusade was odd, too, because it took place on two fronts. They actually, the second crusade was successful in Spain and Portugal, where it pushed back the Muslim occupiers and they retook Lisbon and Portugal. But in the Middle East, it was unsuccessful. The third crusade is what we're going to talk about tonight, and that was 1189 to 1192. So this is a four-year period, five-year period, three, three or four-year period, um, well, four years t technically, that um, was launched upon the rise of probably the most famous of the Muslim uh, military leaders of the Middle Ages. His name was Saladin, uh, Salah al-Din technically, but uh, Saladin as is, is what uh, the Westerners called him, the Crusaders call him. And so uh, Saladin had retaken Jerusalem. He had defeated the Knights Templar in 1187 and retaken Jerusalem. He had actually- and Michael, where did he come from? But like from what nation? So he was from the Ayyubid uh, um, dynasty, which was a group of Muslims that are living around the Holy Land and and somewhat into modern day uh, Saudi Arabia. But um, but he, so the Ayyubids were the the political intrigue in that area of the world is was entirely was this really odd mishmash. It wasn't just Muslims versus crusaders. The Muslim states themselves uh, were continually vying for power and fighting each other as well. Um, from a pure population perspective, you know, well over 80% of that region, uh, of that region was all was Muslim anyway. So it wasn't as if it was a, ever going to be a, a situation where the Christians were going to um, hold out forever if the Muslims got uh, united. And the problem was the Muslims were rarely united. So so they finally were, became united by uh, Saladin. And, and, and he, in a series of sort of power consolidations, he formed the Ayyubid Sultanate, which where he basically took on all comers, beat the uh, Fatimids, um, a number of other the other Muslim dynasties, and and he consolidated his rule basically, and he made his name. He basically was never beaten in open battle um, prior to prior to that, and he successfully defeated the Templars. He was very uh, a very cunning and intelligent com military commander. He would only he would only commit forces fully when he was he had um, done all of his intelligence gathering and was sure that he could win. And um, that's not always true, but most of the time that was true. And and so he, upon retaking Jerusalem and defeating the last of the Templars, uh, the Third Crusade was called in Europe. And the thing that made this unusual was that th the three leaders of the Third Crusade were all kings and or emperors. So you had here, the, they were bi the big names. The biggest name that we all know today is Richard the Lionheart. So King of Normandy, Duke, sorry, King of England, Duke of Normandy, Duke of Anjou, uh, Count. Anyway, sorry, uh, my my medieval uh, history is rusty. I, I don't. I used to know all his titles, but anyway, he was <laughs> he was King, Duke, and Count of a whole bunch of regions of Western France and England, and uh, he was the first of the three major monarchs to to do what they called back then taking the cross, and that meant vowing to make a a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And what that meant for a king, a military king, was conquering and retaking Jerusalem, if possible, um, along the way as part of a crusade. So he took the cross, and he took the cross in 1187, or almost immediately after uh, the news came back 
um, that that uh, you know Saladin had had defeated the, the Templars. And was there a was there a a call to arms like there was in the first one, or was it more like they made an independent decision that we're going to go over there? So the it was kind was it was Pope, kind of right? a tradition now, and so unlike the first crusade, which was Pope Urban, or the second crusade, um, w- which was the Pope at that time as well as. Um, uh, uh, I'll, it'll come to me, but uh, there was a famous Catholic uh, um, intellectual, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, that that actually was one of the major um, um, uh, inspirers of the Second Crusade. The Third Crusade, by this time, it's kind of like a tradition. <laughs> so it was a thing that was happening, almost this this sort of continuous warfare or periodic warfare with and it, you know to fight back against the the pushes of the Isl- forces of Islam across. Uh, Africa, Spain, and the Holy Land. So it was mostly the kings themselves that took this upon themselves. So Richard the Lionheart takes the cross first. Then his primary rival in France, Philip II, or Philip Augustus, as he liked to call himself, um, trying to hearken to the uh, Roman emperor. But he wasn't, he was no Augustus, but uh, he was, he was the major French king. That was the major French king whose name was not Richard. Because remember at that time, of course, Richard the kings of England were were um, spent most of their time in France because their their lands um, and the most of the political intrigue and and, and uh, battling back and forth for their for their lands happened in France. So Philip takes the cross as well, and he and uh, Richard had had a bit of a frenemy relationship going on, where they were at odds with each other and always trying to get the upper hand in terms of securing lands because they were rivals technically as monarchs over what we now call France. Uh, different pieces of what we now call France, but um, but um, they were also um, sometimes allies as well. But anyway, in this case, so Richard, so Richard takes the cross, then Philip II takes the cross, King of France, and then uh, last um, but not least, uh, Edward, uh, sorry, Frederick um, the First of the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick the First of essentially the, a German Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Frederick Barbarossa, he was called Barbarossa, referring to his massive red beard. Um, the guy was a giant of a man. Um, he takes the cross third. And true to German form, he takes the cross third, but he organizes his army first. So so he takes the cross last. And then within a year, he, he's he got a whole a massive um, uh, order of, of army, rather, led by the Teutonic Crusader Knights, because they're they're five major crusading orders at this time. The Teutonic Knights um, were the German order. And so he and the Teutonic Knights, uh, including their grandmaster, leave Germany, uh, well, it's not Germany back then, leave the Holy Roman Empire and begin their march um, to down to basically Byzantium and uh, to do the old fashioned crossing into Turkey and basically follow the path of the first crusade. And, there, and so he's the last to take the cross, but his armies are the first to cross into Anatolia and begin doing the same thing the first crusade did, which was march across Turkey and then down into the Holy Land. And um, so so the Germans get there first and they are extremely successful. Um, they, they The Seljuk Turks that we talked about last time had retaken Anatolia um, and, and crushed the crusader state of Edessa and, and the um, Teutonic Knights and uh, Frederick Barbarossa reconquered them um, in this sort of inevitable, inexorable march across across um, Anatolia, across Turkey, modern day Turkey, until they were about ready to head south into um, into uh, the Holy Land. Meanwhile, <laughs> Philip and and Richard agree to leave on the same day for the Holy Land because neither of them wants to le- let their rivals stick around and start claiming lands after they've gone. Remember, this is, mm. this, this is no, uh, there's, this is not a time of telecommunications. So, so a lot could happen if your rival was gone in a, in a few, uh, in a few months. So they both leave. Um, it takes them different amounts of time to get there though. So they, they take the sea and they go um, down the coast and around Spain and into the Mediterranean. Um, Philip goes, um, with a, mi- a relative minimum of delay, arrives at the Holy Land first. Um, Richard stops at Messina in Italy, reconquers that, ends up stopping in Cyprus, 
conquers Cyprus. Um, and that's a great story. Uh, he, I'll, I'll say, I'll tell you that the spoiler at the end, it's hilarious because it would make a great scene for a movie. Um, Richard's uh, sister gets captured on one of the boats. There, a storm wrecks a fleet and she's thrown and her fleet is uh, takes shelter in Cyprus. And the king of Cyprus, um, who's uh, playing both sides against the middle with the uh, Crusaders and the Muslims, um, he captures her. Richard hears about it and then follows his sister instead of going directly to the Holy Land. And um, when he lands on Cyprus, the king of Cyprus, who has captured his sister, they, there, there's some skirmishes and then the king of Cyprus realizes he's going to lose. So he, he, he says, well, it, I'll give your sister back and we can make peace um, as long as you agree not to, not to put me in irons. Um, you know, binding contract, here's the... And, and Richard says, very well, I agree not to put you in irons. And in the probably first, last, and only time in history, um, upon securing his sister, Richard has um, a series of manacles and chains made, made entirely of silver that he could clap mm. him in so that he could, uh, he, and he takes the King of Cyprus prisoner and conquers the <laughs> island of Cyprus uh, while being able to, with a straight face, say that he did not breach his contract by throwing him in irons. He threw him in silver instead of throwing him in irons. So anyways... Um, Richard arrives last in the Holy Land, and where they arrive, where he arrives, where Philip has already arrived, is in the city of Acre, um, as they used to say it. Acre, as the uh, modern, uh, it looks like Acre, like the unit of land, Acre, the word, but uh, it's the city of Acre. And it, the city of Acre has recently been taken, as uh, not recently been taken, has recently been besieged by uh, Philip's army. Um, so back to Barbarossa. So. The Germans, who were going to be the first to arrive, um, very successfully retake modern-day Turkey. And then, tragically, their m mountain of an emperor dies, drowning in a river, crossing over into the Holy Land. So the Seraph River, he, he's a lead from the front sort of guy. He, both he and Richard are, are a lead from the front sort of, sort of guy. So he's at the front of his armies. And he's crossing this river, which is supposed to be at a ford, but apparently there was a deep part of the ford, and his horse breaks a leg and throws him in, and he's in full armor on the march. And so he drowns before they could pull him out. He was such a huge man that they couldn't pull him out in time, and, and he, he couldn't get out of the water himself because he fell into a deep um, part and essentially drowned. And so without a leader, this massive army of German Teutonic knights squabbles amongst themselves, which is a a pattern to be repeated, as you, we will hear about, and uh, break apart. And some of them uh, go back to the lands in Anatolia and try to establish kingdoms themselves. Some of them go back to Germany, and only about 5,000 of them make it to hmm. the siege of Acre. Um, so uh, just to paint the picture, Acre is a coastal city. It's a major port in the Middle East. And it is uh, the Crusaders' idea is we got to establish a foothold, so we got to take this coastal city first, so then then we can then we can push on to Jerusalem. The siege of Acre is epic. Um, so uh, Philip arri is is the, is the first one to arrive of the three kings. There's actually a um, Guy of uh, Sir Guy or a King, as he fancied himself, King of Jerusalem, um, was had. Sort of, he had come from the city of Tyre up, up north, which was the last remaining stronghold that had Christian knights. And he had started the siege, but he was about to get beat because Saladin comes from behind him. Philip makes it in time to save him, but now the Crusaders are in this very awkward position where there's a coastal city of Acre. The Crusaders are surrounding the city and besieging it, except for, of course, the coast. Um, and then behind the Crusaders comes Saladin's army, and they surround the Crusaders. So now the Crusaders are caught in this surrounding, uh, besieging a city on the inside and being attacked themselves on the outside. Um, the besiegers are being besieged themselves. And as a testament to the uh, incredible um, state of the crusading knight at this time, that, um, that they were able to not only um, not be defeated, but when they were there in force, but, but essentially push back. Saladin's army never, never open. Saladin doesn't commit to uh, to open battle more than a few charges, but but he's just he's continually testing and peppering them, and um and then on, they carried on the siege of Acre as well, at the same time. So nevertheless, um, 
there are a few Germans coming. Like I said, about 5,000 total ended up making it. And it wasn't looking too good for the Crusaders at this point because their, the city of Acre was well defended. One of the funny stories that happened was um, there was a, and my, anyone that understands French is going to have to forgive me here because my French is oui. absolutely hor horrible. What's that? Oh, oui. <laughs> uh, there was a battle, a siege battle that ensued as one of the funny stories during the siege of Acre, where um, the uh, the French built a series of trebuchets um, and trebuchets and catapults at that time threw stones that were a few hundred pounds. And the idea wasn't wasn't to throw massive, unbelievably huge stones. It was to throw a whole bunch of small stones continuously until at a single point until you broke a wall down or a series of walls. And so it was a battle of attrition, essentially. But they would throw these stones that were, you know, three to 500 pounds, usually. Um, this was different. The French, in this case, took a, undertook and, um, and, and siege equipment had gone through a kind of a, a, a minor little um, re revolution uh, in a positive way in the last hundred years. And they had developed these trebuchets, which were much larger. They were about, they could throw stones up to a thousand pounds. Um, and so they were, they had set up this siege equipment and um, they were besieging the walls with it. They even um, built the, what we know, what we, the historians think is the largest trebuchet ever built in medieval history at that point, which hmm. um, the name, the, the name in French was a um, malfoisine, which means bad neighbor. And so they built they they built this massive trebuchet they named the Bad Neighbor, and they this thing could launch um, uh, stones that were like three to five thousand pounds. It was un I get, the physics of it is unbelievable. Well, it also made it a massive target. So the Muslims, of course, that was target number one. So while the while this massive Bad Neighbor was throwing these stones at their walls, collapsing portions of them, they're trying to build them back up. They built trebuchets inside their city targeting um the bad neighbor um treb and which was subsequently destroyed a number of times and there's this funny story of a dominican priest who made it his life's work or, um, and i mean that literally because he was later killed during that battle but uh to raise money unendingly to rebuild the bad neighbor um because it had to be rebuilt so many times that uh that in, in order to 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 make it to the end of the siege so Anyway, there's all there's a lot of these funny stories. So, so I, I I just want to interject a second there, Michael. It's sure. like, can you imagine you got this badass trebuchet? It's giant, and they're like, oh, what shall we call it? But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> the giant. Uh, maybe the ogre. Uh, the dragon. The huge dragon. How about the uh, the bad neighbor? Exactly. Oh, it's so, I hate it's so my French. neighbor. <laughs> I hate my neighbor. It's a bad neighbor. You're like what? You know? Can you imagine that discussion? You're like, come on, guys. Like, call it something badass. <laughs> yeah, but they're French, so it's the bad neighbor. Yeah, it's like it's a, <laughs> that's yeah. the worst they can imagine. the The worst thing they can imagine is a bad neighbor. So, so that's their so that's their their trap. Um, Nevertheless, the Crusaders are about to lose. They're they're being continually harassed. They're having a hard time getting supplied. Richard arrives just in time with a, another uh, our massive army, or massive for that time. By the way, massive army at that point was fifteen to twenty thousand people. Like, like you're transporting across across the ocean. So they he gets an infusion of a they get an infusion of another fifteen to twenty thousand. Um, and at this point, they are Saladin begins opens diplomatic relations because he can see. That they're not they're not moving and they're and they're probably going to take Acre eventually because they're able to um, shut off the harbor with the new ships that that are brought in. Uh, funny story, another funny story. Richard himself, this guy was this guy was a badass. He was in addition to the this you know he was another lead from the front and he did not die, drowned in a river. So he was another lead from the front here, uh, a king. He um, but he got very sick. Um, uh, within days of arriving in Acre, and uh, they thought he was going to die, or he thought he was going to die. So Saladin is sending these emissaries to him every day, trying to trying to um, work out a treaty and make peace, and but not really, just just sort of um, seeing if he can convince them to leave, essentially. And Richard makes a point of 
n- not letting the um, the uh, Muslim ambassador talk to him until every morning there's a ritual. Richard would, if he could, walk, but when he got really sick, he was carried on a litter. He would be carried to the firing line, the archer's line, which was the the the, the bow shot line within bow shot of the walls. And he would make the ambassador sit and watch him with his bodyguard while he, who um, it turns out Richard was an incredible shot with a crossbow in, in addition to being a, a, a lawyer on, on the, in the physical side as well. And he would just sit out there for the first hour. The ambassador would have to watch him pick off um, Muslim archers off the wall of Acre um, with his crossbow, even mm. when he was on his, on his sick bed. And, and he wouldn't talk to him until he had watched him kill at least five or six, maybe 10 guys. And then he would, they would go back in and he would, he would do, do his negotiations. A little, little bit of, uh, little bit of um, preening, I suppose, alpha male behavior before he, um, before hey, he Hey man, if you can do it, if you're that badass. So, so how old was he around this period of time? How uh, old he's a young the... man. So he's in his twenties at this wow. point. Um, so, so um, uh, late twenties, um, but, You've uh, got to say, Michael. I mean, if you look now at, at at everything what's going on around the world, apart from if you know you join the military, uh, which no people normally do in their twenties, because you know they say like you're not going to join the military later on because you you're a little bit more clued up, right? Um, as in that's not a, not a derogatory thing to say, but you know they always say that young men will go to war, right, because they want to prove themselves, they want to test who right. they are and and also they feel like they're they're invincible but you know once you get into your 40s and you feel you get out of bed and your back tweaks you're kind of <laughs> like mm, maybe war is not for me right yeah. well and and I have to tell you what's interesting about Richard is his eternal problem was always his kingdom back home you know we all know it from the the folk tales of Robin Hood um Earl of Loxley Right. Yeah. Um, and 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 uh, his brother, John, who was king and in his in Richard's absence and not a good king. And um, there was a uh, but that was the least of his worries. Uh, John was John was a small thorn in his side because he, he got he got letters, albeit, you know, to, with a month or two delay on the transport. But uh, but he got he, you know, he's finding out what's happening. But it was Philip. That was the real problem because Philip's um, folk, people back home in France were continually maneuvering. And even though Philip had um, sworn, he and Richard had both sworn to not take a hand to take each other's lands. Apparently, that did not that did not extend to his uh, his family and his his uh, go betweens and the, the, the folks that were acting on Philip's behalf. So he was like. I yep. don't know. Like, yep. It wasn't me. Well, Philip, Phil, what Philip was saying, like, hey, I'm here with you, man. I, I don't know. Who knows? And how old was Philip around here? Around the same? Uh, Philip is uh, also, yeah, he's 28, 29 at this point. Can you imagine, like, right? I mean, like I said, in the military, yes, you have people who are colonels, lieutenant bitch. colonels. But we have become so weak. Like, we couldn't even imagine sending a 25 year old off across the world. Most yep. people wouldn't, right? Most well, people would can say. Can you imagine that? Like, let's imagine, like, you know, given the fact they were in their twenties. Let's set that aside for a second. This wasn't just sending their people across the world. This would be as if the president of our country and the prime minister of your country. Oh well, no, not yours, but uh, the country of your birth, the old place, <laughs> the old country. <laughs> if if they had decided, hey, um, there's this war. It's really worth fighting. It must be done. I promise to, to go to this war. You're, you're all, y'all aren't going to see me for years, and I may die over there. But I'm leaving, so uh, take care without me. And they put their affairs in order. Can you imagine our presidents like going out and fighting on the front lines? Uh, I wish they bloody well would right now. I'll be totally up for them. Can you imagine, like, come oh, on, man. Exactly. So yeah. and here, here we have the three most powerful rulers in Europe, and they all swear to go and like, and, and one of them died on the way, you know, like Barbarossa didn't even make it. I mean, well, he fought a ton of battles. He just didn't make it to the actual Holy land. He just, um, but and, it's like, it's like, yeah. you know, if you, if you look back at the 18, sorry, Michael, if you look back at the 1800s, when, you know, I know the book into the sea, the captain of that ship was like 24 years old and he yep. was, it's, it just shows you how we've, 
made especially young boys like so very weak by not saying, you know, you got to get out there, you got to figure this out. I mean, if you're a captain of a ship at 24, 25, when did you start? When were you out there figuring it out? And it was very, very young. It was in teenage years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you look, at, and I know you're a scholar of these things as well, if you look at some of the writings between people, uh, the, the writing is incredibly deep and profound. Um, and these are the people that think. I mean, not not everyone, of course, but... Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to think that, you know, can you imagine right now in the United States of America having a 25 to 30, I know you can't anyway, but if, but if you had a 25 to 30 year old president that like you said, but said, hey, listen, I'm going to go to war and I'm going to go, we're going to go to war and I'm going to go, I, and I'm going to be the, the guy at the front. You'd be like, what? How, yep. What? Like that, it would just never happen. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. And, and then you can see why when they go home that they're adored for the most part, the the, the benevolent ones, Yeah. right? It's amazing yeah, and, to yeah, me. It's, it, it, and people f would follow them like because they were admirable. You know, it reminds right now we're going through this, this slow motion train wreck of a, of a um, political race right now in America. And the thing that I always think as a medievalist, when I look at the people running for president, and I'm not even going to talk about the political side, I'm just going to talk about it from a human perspective, is there is almost nobody that would, that first of all, would these people put their lives on the front line, on, on the line, hmm. in the front lines of a war? And if their rule depended upon people following them, t maybe to death, how many followers would they have? As you said earlier, we are a soft and weak society now. We, there, I mean, if our our rulers don't, they aren't cut from the same caliber as the as the rulers in in these in the time period that we're talking about here. So anyway, about while we were talking, I I did a quick right. fact check because I had to make sure because I'm a medievalist. So technically, Richard was had just turned thirty when he left. So so I thought late twenties. But uh, yeah, he had just turned 30. So he was 29 when he um, took the cross and 30 when he left. So amazing. So it was uh, amazing. Yeah, it was a it was it, it was a different time. Um, and, and people followed him um, to their death and sometimes not, but uh, oftentimes they did. So. So eventually the Crusaders do take the city of Acre. They they break the walls down. The bad neighbor and its ilk do, do that, do its work. They they siege the city while holding off Saladin's army and take Acre. So now they have a, this established this base. And if you look at the coast of the Middle East, there they have kind of two routes to get to Jerusalem from Acre. One is kind of cutting southeast through Nazareth, which is a name most people know, mm -hmm. um, and then on there from there to Jerusalem, turn south and to, and then a little more uh, east to Jerusalem. Or they can go down the coast and uh, to Jaffa, and then from Jaffa um, do the same at Jaffa as they did here at Acre, although Jaffa is a lot smaller of a place, but it's also a port city, and and then use that as a base to cut directly east um, to Jerusalem. And by the way, Michael, let me ask you this, because this is something that comes up quite often. Um, what was the change as well? So we, we're talking a lot about them maneuvering and moving and how fast they move because this has happened multiple times now is this yep. where you have your banking system is this where the uh, where the templars or oh you talk about logistics yeah yeah so the, yeah. yeah so so yeah prior to this um you know the the crusader states were minority uh, minorities in in the mid in a sea of enemies for a hundred years at this point they had to develop very excellent logistics and uh, we're, this this may come up in a, a future discussion of ours, which is what were the effects of the Crusades, and were the Crusades this sort of monumental laying waste to the land, or did they actually result in um, good for good. the people that uh, of the Crusader states and during the times? Aside from the war itself, obviously war, the actual time, uh, a few years of fighting um, that each Crusade held, that's never good for most people. But but um, aside from that those times, was it good or was it bad? And the answer to the question is, it's actually the Crusader states brought a tremendous increase. And this is, by the way, scholars of all types, 
Muslim, Christian, secular, um, doesn't matter. Um, they all agree that the Crusader states and the Crusader governments that were established in the times of peace after each crusade um, increased trade. They bettered the roads. They had more accessible and um, lighter taxation systems. The Crusaders upheld their own standards of religious freedom. There are Muslim scholars that probably at risk to their own life published book in books that the Knights Templar would walk them and protect them in the city of Jerusalem so they could worship at the Aqsa Mosque huh. in Jerusalem. Um, they This is after the Knights Templar had conquered Jerusalem. They... Um, per, they upheld their own principle of religious tolerance, which was that everyone should be able to worship in Jerusalem, Jew, Muslim, or Christian. And, and they were willing to, um, um, to live up to that. And the Muslims recognized that. And, and there were, there was, I'll, I'll read some quotes in our, in our later one, but there are some quotes from these Muslim scholars who probably did not make many friends in some of the Muslim kingdoms that they were writing to, but who would, were, t were sort of uh, admiring, admiring the law and order of the crusader states, the ability to create prosperity and the banking system that they started. The first checks ever written in the history of the world were, were uh, crusader knights um, hmm. writing paper checks in, in France that were then cashed in, in uh, Jerusalem um, because they were part of this universal order that respected even a piece of paper that said, this is worth so many, um, this is worth so, so much real money. And they, and so that was the, uh, the start of the banking system was the, were the crusader orders. Um, so this was a, it was a very different world from what I was taught when I was in sixth to eighth to 12th grade about what the crusades were. The crusades actually brought a tremendous amount of prosperity, trade, n knowledge transfer, and peace to the areas that they controlled in the Middle East. All right, but anyway, that's probably a discussion for a different a different night. Um, so, so this third crusade. So now comes the the defining moment of the third crusade, which is the only massive open battle between. Um, the Muslims and the Christians, like open field battle. We had a lot of battling going on in the siege of Acre, but it was an open field battle. So the, the, o the only massive open field battle that occurred in the Third Crusade, and it was a big one, um, was um, in Arsuf, uh, which is uh, on the way to Jaffa. So between the Acre, uh, the coastal city of Acre and the coastal city of Jaffa, the Crusaders had to march south. They had to march around Mar Mount Carmel. Also a hmm. well-known um, place in the Bible and and uh, and in that region, and then they had to march to Jaffa to take it. And along the way, the armies of Saladin were shadowing them the whole way, and um, and looking. Saladin was looking for the right opportunity while they were strung out in a line with all their baggage to attack them. He was always probing and testing them. And Richard knew that was the case. That was going to be the case. But that was the only way. So he chose that southern route because he wanted to be able to be resupplied. So he basically had a supply ships sailing alongside his army as it marched mm. so, that, so that they could um, bring wounded out and resupply. And he logistically, he, he you know, this was this was the strength of the European kingdom at this point. They were they, their their supply logistics were excellent um, for the medieval world anyway. And and uh, so he. He he starts marching, but let's let's uh, let's let's uh, back up a bit because um, of the three kings that started the third crusade, the first one dies on on the way um, to the Holy Land, which is uh, Frederick Barbarossa. The second one to go is Philip. So Philip gets very sick at the end of the of the siege of Acre, and um, he then he starts to recover, but unlike Richard, who recovers to then fight personally in battle and lead his men, Philip says, I'm too sick. I've fulfilled my obligation. We've, we, and we, and I'm going home. So he leaves. So uh, he leaves uh, there. There's still a lot of French troops there. Um, and he leaves them under the command of the Duke of Burgundy. Um, and uh, there, and the Knights Hospitaller who are later to become the Knights of Malta. Um, you know, are are uh, with the French knights at this point, but he goes. So all we're left with is Richard. Um, so Richard then is the major leader, but um, it's 
um, he's he's leading a force of Europeans that are very fractured because in the this is not a large command and control army. Um, this is a bunch of nobility who all spent their own money and basically put their 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 wealth on the line to raise enough money to bring households of knights and men at arms. You know, each of them bringing a few hundred men at arms with them, and and maybe maybe um, a few dozen knights. And there's so these there are these groups, and they are from the Holy Roman Empire. They're from um, Hungary. They're from uh, Italy. They're from France. They're from England. They're from all over the place. And so while they all recognize that Richard the Lionheart is the only, is the their leader. Um, with the Duke of Burgundy from France being the second, um, and uh, Guy um, being the king of, of Tyre and supposed king of Jerusalem, who's now been ousted, being the third. Um, he, they are not happy about it. And um, everything that happens after this point, aside from the battle itself, is shows you the disunity of the political infighting that kind of tanked the the end of the cruise and determined the and end. How did they how did they communicate? Well they're all together. What, what, so they're all marching together. Um But I mean what language? Would, would they speak in Latin? Um, oh um the, the different forms of uh yes of, of French um a colite, I think it's called and and um English. I mean they they Latin is how they write, so that all their scribes write in Latin. Um that's that's the formal language of the church at this point and sort of the lingua franca from the the written word. But also they all speak different languages. This is their their you know, it this is true today and it was true back then you know the 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 nobility of the holy roman empire spoke versions of french and the french spoke english and french and um you know the the folks french french was the or versions of french were the was the major language um it was as the phrase goes the lingua franca of the spoken <laughs> world was french um or versions of it and so they they that's what they're talking to each other in most of the time but it's all about who's who has the authority to continue the crusade. Richard is definitely the top dog, but he can't command everyone the way he commands his own vassals. So because yeah. they come from all these different kingdoms. So they're all there bound by their vow to try to retake Jerusalem. And the, so they're bound by the crusader vow. But that doesn't mean that they are they're they're bound to obey every command of Richard. They usually do. Um, and they put him in charge militarily in the battle thankfully but um but uh yeah so so here they are marching along the lines uh, you want to get back to the battle um so arsuf was the one i was telling you all about uh, last time where um where they were where it showed the the absolute unbelievable i mean the the medieval knights okay so let, let me let me um the total army was not very large that left Acre. A lot of soldiers had died. A lot of soldiers had gone home after they retook Acre. Um, the, the, the armies of the Crusaders were only about 12,000 men at that point. Um, the, the fighting force, not the baggage train and all the suppliers and everything, but the fighting force was only 12,000. Of those 12,000, less than 1,500 were knights. So most of them are men hmm. in arms. So, but the knights themselves, these guys, uh, to call them the special forces of the Middle Ages is not quite to do them justice. The medieval knight was the closest thing to a minute on his, ho on his horse with its barding and armor was, which is the same thing, um, is the equivalent of a, of a tiny medieval tank. Um, as you'll find out from this ba these battles, uh, this, this, this battle and then e basically every other time. And the, and the Crusaders had learned how to fight against the Muslims at this point, um, which is essentially don't fall for the bait. Do not go charging after them until you're assured of being able to catch them do, because they, the Muslims had faster, lighter horses. They, had, they wore less armor. Their horses were of a type which was um, more nimble and they could always outrun the European horses. And... So and they and that's what they would do. They would just outrun them and then they'd circle around and shoot you from behind and do these um these uh flanking attacks um that would disrupt your line and then ultimately break you. But the Europeans had learned if they formed their shield wall and they just stood there and took it for as long as they could and tempted the Muslims to getting close, that was the only way to win. But when they did that, these guys were basically unstoppable. 
So what happens is Saladin's looking for the best possible opportunity. He waits until they're all strung out. He waits until their vanguard of Guillaume Lyon, uh, not Lyon, um, L I S G N E, however you pronounce that. Um, um, but he's the he's the um, t- he's the king of Tyre. He's the Crusader king that has actually been living in the Holy Land and the only one left um, that Saladin didn't hadn't got around to taking his city. Um, and and he um, he leads the vanguard and Saladin waits at, at, until they're in the middle of their march, many days in, and they're strung out and the vanguard is too far ahead. And um, essentially what you have is in the vanguard is all of the uh, the uh, remnant of the crusaders from the Holy Land. In the middle of the group, you have all the English knights and the, and with the, some of the knights Templar. And then in the rear, you have the knights Hospitaller with the French knights. And um, for whatever reason, um, which I will not comment on, uh, Saladin decided that the weakest point was going to be to attack the French in the in the in, in the rear, and um, so he waits until they're all strung out. <laughs> Did you really say that <laughs> to attack the French in the rear? Oh my gosh! Sorry about that. Uh, sorry. But of course, uh, <laughs> but I will get attacked in uh, the poopal. I will get attacked in the rear. I'm really glad that you said that, and not me. I definitely didn't imply that at all. Not at all. <laughs> but they are French. They are French. Like, um, I do not want to do this crusade anymore. I will go home uh, with my mistress. <laughs> exactly. So go on. So, so yeah. he, he does, so the, he does the, a the classic. The Holy Land move. and the coast of the Holy Land at this time is very different from the way it is now. Um, uh, there was a lot of marshland back then. There were orchards and and forests, um, which were which were um, devastated in the 20th century. But back in those days, you know, we're talking 800 years ago. Um, there were there, it was actually quite rich and lush. Um, there, it was still very hot um, during the summer months, and it was and there was plenty of um, savanna and, and near desert. But um, but it was there was a lot of there was a lot more green green back then. And so um, Richard um, had waited and set up set up this situation where he he made sure that he stopped to rest his knights when there was marshland between him and because they he knew Saladin was sh- shadowing him with his forces. Um, they had scouts and they they saw that, but the Muslims would stay in the hills. Um, so finally, when they're in the middle of their march and the vanguard has got out too far, um, many miles ahead. Um, the Muslims come in and attack, and they come in in a full line to force the um, the all of the Crusaders to turn and face them. Also, in their own line, basically just to put down, take cover, and form lines up. But they couldn't, you know, form up into into units very effectively. But they the um, the uh, Muslims put the most of their forces in the north which was the bag, which was the rear of the of the crusaders which was where the french knights and the hospital knights were and so um that was the brunt of his army was there trying to basically collapse that the end of that that um that fort that the train what ensued was hours literally hours of muslim horsemen and infantry slamming into um the wall of knights over and over again shooting um unreal amounts of arrows this was where that 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 i told the 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 the, um uh, account of what the knights would do where they would just stand there like a wall and take all the arrows you know put their shields up they had these massive kite shields for the ground and then they they had um heater shields they were called smaller ones for when they were mounted and they would they would put the shield wall up. They would arrows would come in by the hundreds. And they would just wither this. They would let they would weather the storm, and then they would um, um, they themselves would get hit. Um, they would they would have to turn their backs sometimes to to cut their shields. You know, um, and they would get hit in the back with arrows. And it didn't matter. Um, the the knights had um, four layers of armor and cloth cloth armor and metal armor. That they were these guys were beasts. They were it was unreal. One of the you know at the end of like, like the, there was a um, uh, record found of a medieval helmet 
from a French uh, knight in battle. The helmet itself, um, and this was a, a, a the helmet itself weighed seventy pounds. The helmet and shoulders. Wow! Um, wow! Th- th- we're just talking just sheets of metal, and then they had three other layers: leather and padding. And then two layers of cloth, one on the top, one on the bottom. And the top layer of cloth, which are, which are the tabards that we would wear over, they were actually practical because they would soak them in water to keep everything themselves cool. So they would march with sort of wet outer clothing to um, um, keep the sun off them and keep them cool because they're marching metal. And then they're metal, chain mail mostly, but hard armor, helmets, and um, some greaves. And uh, then two layers of padded uh padding with some leather, but mostly padded cloth, and then a final layer underneath. So four layers of armor. So these guys would look like they could get shot with hundreds of arrows, and they would just take their swords, and they would just cut through the arrows, and they look like porcupines, and they didn't they didn't care. They would So they stood there for hours, taking these charge after charge, and the French keep, keep signaling to Henry, let us charge, we're about to break, let us charge, and Henry was like, wait, wait wait until they engage more. And he was waiting for the Mamluks. So the Mamluks are Saladin's um, heavy cavalry. They're the only ones that, that anyone thought could stand up to the, to to the um, crusader knights, the elite. Um, And he hadn't committed them yet. And so Henry, not Henry, Richard is watching them approach, but he, but they stay unengaged. And so for hours, the Crusaders just held the line, held the line, tempted them closer. The Crusader crossbows did a lot of damage um, because their knights um, were excellent shots. It wasn't just that they had, it wasn't like the knights did one thing and the crossbows did another. The knights actually had crossbows themselves and their minute arms had crossbows. So when the, when the, um, uh, when the Muslims got too close, they would, they would do a lot of damage to their, air, to their horses and such and, and the men and take many of them down. But, um, the Muslims just kept throwing everything at that um, rear guard, which is the far left flank of the Crusader Knights. And um, finally, after hours and a series, I think a total of four formal requests from the Duke of Burgundy and the um, and the head of the French Knights, the uh, Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller, begging. Richard to let them charge and him not letting them charge and just weathering and the the supply of arrows Muslim arrows was getting lower and lower and lower and the Muslims getting more frustrated and the Brit and the um, French getting more frustrated and line and breaks starting to happen in their lines um at that point Saladin sent the word and his Mamluks engaged on that far flank <laughs> and at that moment two hospital or knights broke ranks against orders and charged by themselves um, uh, after three hours of watching some of their friends die, but mostly just weathering this, these absolutely harrowing attacks, literally, you know, think uh, the movie 300 and the arrows that you saw in the air, just, just that for hours, they finally couldn't take it anymore. And they snapped and broke. And when that happened, hit um, Richard, who was watching closely from the middle of the line, saw that and realized the Mamluks are coming in. Now's our chance. And so he ordered the general charge and the knights um, went out. And what happened was the Mamluks, the heavy um, Muslim uh, cavalry, impeded their own line in their retreat in the lines of lighter cavalry and infantry. And so the, the lighter cavalry and infantry got cut down by the by the crusading knights who then slammed into the Mamluks and a short battle ensued um, at which it was heartily established that not even the heavy cavalry of the Muslims could stand up to the Crusader Knights. And they just blew through, like these guys just blew through. Now what you're talking about now is about a, is only about 1100 Knights. Okay. So, but they just basically routed this army of 25,000 Muslims um, because the Muslims had about 25,000 warriors, about double the, the Christian army. And about a thousand knights routed them and chased them back to the hills um, and killed about seven thousand of the of the of the Muslims. Um, did not do enough damage to disperse his army, but dealt Saladin his first loss and only loss on the field of battle ever. 
And he, at that point, retreated and let the crusaders have their way. And he turned totally to um, harassing their supply lines and refused to engage them in open battle again. Oh, really? He was like, yeah, I don't want any of that. No, I'm not having any more of that. So the crusaders um, lost, total crusaders lost was about 700, a little under 700, um, of which only a few dozen were knights. Um, It's a testament just to how just their their uh, sheer um sense of order and and discipline that they were able to stand up to that for so long takes so little casualties but i i just have to say in a way the crusading knights their technology their military tech for their time was just head and shoulders above the military tech of anyone else in the world they had to deve- why was that or well they what? had they had devoted um two centuries since charlemagne to basically the um, uh, armor and weapons craft, like they 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 were fascinated by the Europeans had always been um, fascinated by traditions of military order and knighthood, which basically um, trained people to be these living tanks, these super warriors, and the um, their tradition of in a way it was kind of like the samurai, although the samurai went to di- different routes from a militaristic fighting tradition. They had a different style and everything. But essentially, the point was they were supposed to be these paragons of military virtue. It was like the entire German fighting spirit had become Christianized, so they turned to order. And so instead of the German Germanic tribesmen, they, were, they became these pillars of military paragons that they were on there. And, and all of their technology was turned to metallurgy better weapons, better hand weapons, better missile weapons, better siege weapons. They were um, incredibly innovative, that culture was, in the art, military arts. And they punched way above their weight in numbers when it, whenever it came to the battlefield. They were feared across the Middle East, the Crusader, Crusader Knights. Well, can you imagine like seeing that thing coming at you on a horse? Yep. I you're, mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, probably... Uh, one to two thousand pounds of muscle and metal charging at you. Uh, if you count the horse, the rider, and all the barding and all of the armor on the on the things, I mean, this is this is not this is nothing. Be, like you're not going to stop that. It just they just smashed through everything. So, so that must have been a big uh, a big psychological blow for Saladin as it well. It was. It was. I'm going to summarize what happened after that. Essentially, um. The the success in beating off Saladin was a great boost to, to to Richard, and he was able to successfully capture Jaffa and then start to march to Jerusalem. But they reached; they were halfway through their march, and it was winter. And the Europeans, um, now that Saladin um, pulled away and would not attack them directly, began squabbling among themselves. They had no enemy to fight, so they started fighting themselves. Not militarily fighting themselves, but um, there was just tremendous disagreement and open rebellion against Richard but from the other knights that did not owe him fealty under the feudal system. They were just there for their crusading vows, so he couldn't command them. He could. They had vowed to follow him in battle, but they had not vowed to follow him when it was not battle hmm. because he was not their liege lord. Philip was, or... Um, uh, Frederick's sons back in uh, the Holy Roman Empire were, or you know, other other rulers back in. So uh, they they had a vow to try to make you know reach Jerusalem, but they did not um, have a vow to obey a Richard except in battle. And so when Saladin removed the battle, then Richard became a lot weaker. So Richard, realizing this, begins worrying immensely about what's happening back home because he's getting more and more missives about what's going wrong. Um, as and also, Philip's gone back, right? Yep, Philip's gone back. Philip is stirring the, the pot and conniving yeah. and beginning to actually take some of the lands in Anjou um, that, that Richard had and other, um, other uh, parts of France. And so... It's it, Richard is is feeling his his uh you know uh his the sand slipping away from under his feet from a from a, a royalty perspective like he's he's the only king left and all the uh, everyone else is playing the games back in Europe and he's out here and he can't get these guys these these princes and nobles to do enough of them to do what he needs so he does what he can which is um he he 
he realizes that there's a base of operations, basically the, the Fatimid uh, Muslims in Egypt, um, who have taken the, the defeat of Saladin as a sign that Allah is not with him, uh, Allah's favor is not with him anymore. And so they started mm. with, uh, to, to make pushes for, of their own for Jaffa. And Jaffa is retaken behind um, Richard as he's halfway to, to Jerusalem. So he takes his, 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 his um, armies and he decides to go back to Egypt and basically crush the Fatimids and then go back and he's, his plan is to circle back up and take Jaffa again. Um, and except that he's d halfway there, he changes his tactic, realizes he doesn't want to get embroiled in Egypt and does what I ho I'm hoping someday someone makes a movie about because there are plenty of movie movie worthy scenes that I've described already, but um, this one is one of the coolest scenes in military medieval military history. Richard decides to to retake Jaffa because he's having some prob supply problems secretly. It's, it's almost impossible to be secret about an army marching, so he starts his army marching <laughs> away from Egypt back towards Jaffa, but then he takes essentially a special forces group of just a hundred or two knights he gets on a single ship himself and just these knights and sailors of course to sail the ship yeah and while his army is coming back up to jaffa and the muslims are focused on the army and they preparing for a siege in the city of jaffa his one ship comes up lights out in secret at night breaks through in, in through their harbor chain and takes the port while his army is outside appearing on the horizon outside the walls of Jaffa. So they're all focused outwardly and fights his way by night with these hundred knights through the city, lighting the city on fire as he's going in this basically special forces action, takes a key gatehouse at the corner of the city, the city wall and signals to his men who then pour in from the outside as he opens the gatehouse, that gatehouse um, small door, and lets his men into the city and retakes Jaffa in one day um, hey. by fighting himself. Like, this is just, this is like Hollywood stuff. He's That's he, amazing. He and a hundred knights fight their way through the city at night in con sowing confusion and fight their way to a gatehouse. H him at the front lines, you know, cutting down men himself, um, and and retake and the city in one day and so um it's a it's a really cool so um um you know siege story it's the siege that wasn't because it never turned into a siege and uh but then you know he's in a bad position because he's half his arm half of the forces won't obey him he's got jaffa back so he can resupply but his kingdoms are falling apart back in france and so he opens up negotiations with Saladin. Well, he continues negotiations. Saladin all this time has been continually sending messengers and trying to open negotiations. And um, Richard finally opens negotiations and uh, comes to a peace agreement, which um, where Saladin agrees to let the Christians keep what they'd conquered in um, Acre and Jaffa, but then um, promise not to take Jerusalem while Saladin's alive, and um, and 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 uh, you know, knowing that Richard is going to go home, and also gave Richard and the leaders of um, the Crusade the um, the free passage to make their vow and make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem on um, personally. So they did. So Richard goes to Jerusalem under a banner of truce and makes his pilgrimage along with um, his the knights and the nobility, and then they, then he goes home. And um, Saladin would die one year later of typhoid. Um, so there's a, uh, you know, the, the Christians then begin their plans to renew, the, to, to retake the Holy Land. Uh, there are a number of other crusades after that. Um, but um, the, the third crusade ends in 1192 um, with that peace treaty between Richard, the, the Lionheart, and Saladin. Hmm. And, uh, and there you go. On the way back home, he is uh, shipwrecked and captured and spends years in prison and finally gets back in 1194 um, to England and France. And that is another story. But uh, there, there you go. There's, there's me talking for an inordinate amount of time about it. No, I no, think no. Is, is the I'm, coolest I'm, crusade. I'm loving it. I th that's why you have to forgive me. Like I, I was like, okay, I'm listening, listening. I'm like, 
I have nothing to say. This is fantastic. I'm Sorry. Gonna, I'm going to just sit back and enjoy it. You know, I'm just going to. And look, I think I think everyone else that is listening to this is going to feel feel absolutely the same. I, I mean, it is um, more than you ever wanted to know about a crusade, but but it's it's pretty awesome. Um, and it and it's 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 it, it has all those elements of that sort of epic, inspirational. Um, well, crusade, a, a journey, a military yeah. journey, and and uh, folks that you know, soldiers that are fighting for what they truly believe is right, and which I can make a case was in fact right, uh, both according to their beliefs at the time, but also even according to our principles of just warfare. But uh, anyway, that's a, a again another well, another well, topic. You, you know what? I'd, what I'd love to do. What I'd love to do is this because I think now with the last video and this video. Um, people now know the truth, right? Pretty much, it might be, you know, we didn't go specifically granular on it. Yep. But what I would like to do is to open this up to the people that have watched this and say, okay, I want you to write down the comments, any questions you have for Michael. And what we'll do is we'll either do a live stream, because we spoke about this before, we'll either do a live stream, get you guys on, uh, and you can ask Michael the questions there and then. And I would also like to get into the just war. Um, the topic of the just idea war, of right. just war. Right. And also to talk a little bit about, um, if you, as you like, the truth about the Crusades, because we've we've set the stall out right now. Right. Like we've we've, we've said this is what it is. Right. Because there's there's been over. I mean, I don't know when, Michael, you'd know when the BS started about saying that, oh, no, the Crusaders were bad and, and all the lies about that. Like, I'd really like to get into that and maybe have someone come on and ask questions about it and maybe, you know, push a little bit, push the buttons a little bit. Well, you know, I've heard this and I've heard that because remember, if, if you guys th just think about this, with what happened in the first Crusade, let's just take the two, the first and the third, right? What you guys know now, a few years ago, there were people that were doing a pilgrimage across Europe, apologizing for the Crusades, like apologizing. Now, look at what these guys and gals or these families, what they risked for freedom, right? Yeah. That's because, that, as you said, it wasn't just like, oh, yeah, we're going to be an oppressive, um, you know, Christian nation. It was We are going to allow you to practice your faith there, even though you guys kind of broke your promise the other way. Um, so these are, are, they were defensive wars, as you've said, the defensive crusades. And I think that I'd like to get into the, the finer points, but I'd like to do it in a way that we ask the audience to come in because I had some great questions, Michael, some really, really great questions. So uh, in Sounds short... Good. Write down your questions underneath, and myself and Michael will either do a live stream where we'll come back and we'll we'll not only go through them, but we'll take your questions live. Um, be fun. Or we'll do a whole video on it and then do a um, a live stream, right? Because there's a lot here. And by the way, me and Michael, uh, as you've seen in my other videos with Trevor, and with like me and Michael can talk about a thousand subjects for a thousand hours, right? Like we could just sit there and talk about a bunch of things, which is when we, we live, we were neighbors back in Pasadena. Uh, we would frequently do that. Actually. <laughs> Usually with, with, with sufficient alcohol to, uh, with, with sufficient alcohol. Um, so I'd really like to do that again, uh, uh in the future. Sorry. I'd like, you to. know, have you back, yep. uh, and go through, go through those elements. Right. Yep. So yep. that'd be, it'd be cool awesome with you. Yeah, I'd love to love to take questions. Um, there's so much to say, and I end up I, I apologize. I end up rambling a lot, but um, because there's so much there, um, and I'm not I'm not my goal here wasn't to write a paper about it. Um, it, <laughs> it. It was it was just to kind of give people a taste of what actually happened and the realities of you know as as you may have noticed from the end of the story, this wasn't just a story about a bunch of fanatics trying to kill each other. There was a lot of there. There was a lot of political intrigue. There was a lot of, of very um, you know problems that ever people have to deal with, even even rulers, but uh, normal people as well. 
um, that were impacted by these crusades and they dealt with in very practical ways. Um, and there's more to be said on that front. Yeah. Um, so, so the, these were, these were not this sort of nightmarish event, um, events that you get this painted in. There were it definitely like this, this, this horde of, of knights, like going through the countryside, like raping and pillaging as no. they go. I mean, I know that there were, as you said before, there were, there were some bad people at some point. Always. Which there always, always are. Every, every army, you can't, you can't pick a group of humans, let alone a group of humans with weapons throughout history that, that there, are, there aren't bad apples in. There's always bad apples. Um, w what's interesting about this situation is like w with the Third Crusade, there are basically zero examples in the Third Crusade of the, um, you know, from the, from the Siege of Acre on of the Europeans, of, of the Crusader Knights doing any of the raping and pillaging stuff. I mean, they, they definitely had to strip the land as they moved, but Saladin did it for them. Well, he, I mean, poisoned, he poisoned his own well, his own people's wells, and and burned all his own people's land so that the Crusaders couldn't have any food. So you know, I mean, it was a, it was a you know scorch, yeah, and, and scorch that's common. They did that. They did Very that common. in the siege of Malta as well. They poisoned yep. the wells. I mean, it, that's what you're going to do, right? Yep. I mean, that's what that's, that's it, it, is the war. And, it and is that's, war. And that's what I want people to take away from this: the Crusades. The there's really sort of interesting and fascinating aspects to them, but. Ultimately, we're just talking about medieval warfare, and er and things that happened there were par for the course. There was nothing. There's the. It's a really interesting question that you ask, which is, where did it happen that we've turned the Crusades into this sort of scapegoat for all evil religious war? You know, people. Um, this is what they do. Um, where did that mentality come from? I, I suspect I know the answer to that. I haven't. I haven't um, dug in yeah. on the research too far but i i know some of the start of that from an historian's perspective i know when the bias against the crusades began but um from from the academic perspective but uh but, but i anyway, have an idea <laughs> there are there there are some markers but uh yeah we could talk about it and it would be fun to take people's questions yeah like i said i mean i think it's a fascinating subject and i think that what you do is you you humanize it, right? We we start seeing these people as real people. Yep. I mean, I, even just to describe a helmet being seventy pounds, seventy pounds. I mean, how strong would you have to be? And I mean, imagine. Listen, I mean, I get a bad back, like getting out of bed. You know, I don't know, like standing there for hours and hours, getting marching hit it, with marching you know, in it. Yep. Well, I'm just thinking about like you're in, you're getting shot at with arrows for well, hours and hours and hours and taking it, and you've still got to keep focused mentally. You've got to you're in the uh, I mean the, you're in the, the in the in the summer sun. This was a battle in uh, late August and September um, in in the Middle East. So this was it was it was terribly hot in the middle of the day. Saladin attacked on purpose at that time because he knew that was the time when the Crusaders were at their they had been marching for hours. You know what's funny about the the seventy pound metal? It works both ways, right? If you if you are enough of a tank of a man that you can hold that thing on your head along with all your other armor, here's one thing that's not going to happen: you aren't going to get killed by an arrow. There isn't an arrow fired from a horse archer made that's going to go through that armor. So, you know, it's in other words, it, they they built the warrior culture sufficient to be the pinnacle of their of of warriors in that air region of the world and they were the tanks so you can yeah. fire whatever you can take however many handguns you want and fire at a tank you're not going to get through and and thousands of muslim um of of horse archer arrows are not going to get through armor that that impressive um and they didn't um so it was it's a um, it's 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 a fascinating culture um and subculture. So and Michael, just a little again aside to all that. Um, you know, the the origins of this as well, you know, going back in the day from you know what this means, um obviously coming from the archers, mm -hmm. right? The British archers. Um, you know, if you I'm I'm sure you know that story. If you do, I'll let you tell that story. But um well, I've talked enough. <laughs> Well, it was Agincourt, right? It was Agincourt. Yep. It was the the British longbowmen that were famous. I mean, they were they were super super famous. 
Uh, and so what the French did was when they caught the bowmen, and they chopped their fingers off, they chopped these two fingers off yep. so that they couldn't uh, pull a bowstring anymore. Yep. And so that comes, th th this is what they did to the French saying, look, I've still got my, my fingers. I've still got my two fingers. So, so that's how the, like the go away right. uh, reference comes from. But the reason why I say this is because you, you, you reference the culture and they used to get those kids, like from a young age, they would get them pulling a bow, and and they were famous for being way more muscular on one side of their body than the other, right, right Michael? I mean, that right. was and, and hunched back, by the way, which we, which we we know from graves. So the archaeologists they can they know who the archers are because you can see they have a scoliosis because these people. These guys, well, and we're talking Agincourt now. So now we're in the 14th century, which is a so we're a couple hundred years after the Third yeah. Crusade and the English technology. Speaking of that love of military technology, the English just leaned way into the bow because because it, it was great equalizer on the battlefield. And the English have always had um, fewer people than the French when they're fighting, um, you know, uh, in in uh, medieval warfare. But they would the yeomen would be pulling these bows which had no let off so no com no <laughs> these were not compound bows not compound bows right <laughs> um, they weren't compound bows and, um they had a, they had straight draws of uh 80 90 and 100 pounds um some of them um 110 120 and they had uh, they, and so they and they practiced with them so much that they their spines literally curved and like you said the right side their right arm was unbelievably strong, you know, so much stronger than their than their left because they had to draw with it. Um, but these bows were, I mean, they were they were amazing. And another example of military technology. But um, yeah, this is this is and this is what um, you know people often ask, like, how were the Crusades so successful given the relatively tiny amount of people and they're traveling halfway across their their medieval world. Um, much many of them dying on the way and then they fight these battles and how are they ever successful you know let alone successful um many times over hundreds of years um and it it really does come down to there's something about especially that the the germanic french uh, and, and and british uh well english peoples and celtic peoples that is really sort of innovative when it comes to this and have a they have a they have a martial culture and a martial spirit to them that's a little different from most other cultures um and uh and they they leaned into it big time and then then you had the the religious element to it too this was mm -hmm. this was not just a matter for the physical conquering this was a matter of your soul as well and uh that meant something to those to the people of that time uh and it's sad that we don't have that right now uh I think that when yeah. you look back at what these people were willing to do and for, you know, both of us who are, you know, fairly faithful men, I'd like to say, uh, I mean, the idea of going and dying is never a, an attractive thing, but there's no. the, certainly going and fighting for what you believe in is Right, and, and that we've been stripped of that apart from if you want to go, I mean, look, even if you go and join the military, which, you know, one of the one of the most amazing things I've spoken about this multiple times when I was in Black Hawk Town, that those guys would sign up. These nineteen year old, eighteen, nineteen year old guys would sign up, and 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 the response when I asked them, "Why did you join the military?" and they said, "For freedom," right? So they would even go abroad and fight for other people's freedom. But there's something about, um, and this that is the closest to this. But there's something about you turning around to your buddy and going, hey, Michael, let's go. We've got to do this. Like, we right. have to do this. And then going into your closet and whatever, getting your rifle out and then saying, kissing your wife and kids goodbye and saying, I have to do this. I have to do this for my faith. And we've kind of been robbed of that because you can't do that in this day and age, really. You know, what's not the, here, not in Western society. That's right. And what's fascinating to me when I look back at the medieval, the Middle Ages, um, the medieval times, was it, it, let's let's take the people that had the most power. I've talked a lot about them on this podcast so far. You take people like Richard the Lionheart and Philip II and Frederick the um, First. These are the most powerful men in Europe. 
and and um you just gave them a big old coin and say flip the coin and if he comes up heads you're dead you're going to go on a journey and you come yeah. up heads you're dead and if he comes up tails you'll probably almost die a bunch of times and then you might make it back um and and w why this is <laughs> there yeah. are things in life that are worth risking your life for and, yeah. and your livelihood for and these men knew it and and they acted on it and uh it gives and them they had the, the most cushy life actually exactly. out of anyone and and, and, and richard yeah. and philip and frederick knew they weren't going to get any conquests out of this like the best that was going to happen was they reestablished the crusader states they weren't going to have control over those crusader states this wasn't the international 21st century age where they could they could exert power over over you know a thousand miles away in some other country. The best that was going to happen was they were going to recreate the Fukuyama Seder states. Then they were going to go home a lot older and maybe wounded. And and who knows what would happen to their efforts? Well, they, uh, they yeah, were doing what it for might a happen while purpose. they're away. Yep, you, and, we've and already then, said they might not that even they come home. Exactly, they might not even come home to a kingdom. Because and so and these are the people with the most power. So so explain that to me. They were also very rational people. These were not frothing at the mouth religious fanatics. You can tell so from their actions. They were highly political animals, um, and they cared about their people. And they were very practical. And you know, uh, Richard diverts his whole cause to go go save his sister um, uh, for for two months. And so. Um, it's really a um, the, these were real people. They had they, they they were not brainwashed religious fanatics, but neither were they power hungry Machiavellian types because they would have never left their kingdoms if that was the case. That yeah. there was there was there was something noble and deeper. There was the protection of the Christians in those faraway lands. There was the good that they were doing in in um, freeing the holy city. They hoped um, from from uh, uh, from you know, persecution, the Christian persecutions that were going on. So um, th they're a lot more nuanced and they're a lot more real and they're a lot more, dare I say, noble than than uh, people tend to be nowadays living in soft societies. But, you know, I, I think that's true. But I've also seen from the response to this video is the people really respond to it. You know, yeah. they, they really respond to it's, that it, idea. It is and... in the human heart. You're right. It is right. I mean, but also in in particular people more so, I think, uh, because they, when you're in a situation, isn't it funny, Michael? Like we're in a we're in a world where we have everything, right? We have everything. I mean, you and I are richer than the richest person in the world a hundred years ago, right? But because we have more stuff, right? More stuff. Definitely more comfortable, that's for sure. More comfortable. We, you know, I mean, look, we have running water. We have hot water. You know, we, we can order food from our fingertips and it can turn up at the door. You know, we can order cooked food. It can turn up at the door. You know, these are things that were reserved for kings like and billionaires. Yep. You know, to have, have, a, have a chef there that would deliver your food and we have this. You know, we can get into a, a not a horse-drawn carriage and drive wherever we want, and then we can get on a plane and fly anywhere in the world and see the world. I mean, it, it's it's really remarkable. But why are we so attracted, like Paul, towards struggle hmm. and uh, and pain and uncomfortable situations? Right, like there's something about us that wants that, and certainly more with men. Right, we want to be tested. We well, do want to be tested. Right? That's right. There's something in us that j it's just like, oh, you know, I, you know, whether it's, you know, can I do this? Can I build that? Can I, you know, run a marathon? And and I think that a lot of that, if you don't mind me saying so, Mike, it is as we as we're getting older, it's kind of transferred some of that into this middle life crisis that mm. that, that people have. Right, because their midlife crisis, you know, tends to be, well, I'm going to go and get a Harley Davidson. I'm going to drive a lot of well, right, or I'm going to have an affair, which is what a lot of people do. You know, all of a sudden they're like, okay, I want to go and and you know seek my happiness somewhere yeah, they else. They think they're they feel like they're missing <clears throat> something in life, so they're just, they just take yeah, a but and and they are missing something in life. They are missing something in life, but you know, 
a lot of it has to do with an unfulfilled life up until that point. A lot right. of it because everyone everyone has those moments. I think, you know, certainly for me, I always was like, I don't understand like these people having what they call a midlife crisis. And, but then you get to a certain age, you get to 50, for example, and you're looking you're like the downslope is a lot closer to me, right? Like I'm on the, you know, you are, I mean, theoretically, physically and all and all that, you're heading towards, you know, your, uh, your death. And I think that that makes you examine your life more. I wish that we did that more. I, I don't know if it's, these people examine their life at 25 more because they were much more likely to be killed tomorrow, you know, whether it be Viking Raiders or, you know, they're going to, you know, you go and drink the wrong water and then you're going to be dead. Uh, you, you're not, you're not going to go to the ER. You're not going to go around to the urgent care. You're just going to so be I dead. Think no. that, yeah. You're just going to be so, so an examination of your mortality happened very, very early. Well, and, and nowadays them. we hide from mortality. The, the last place people want to be like very, people used to see birth and they used to see death a lot more. And, and nowadays we don't, um, and, and we're separated from our mortality. And so then when you get those inklings, like you were talking about with the midlife crisis or some other situation springs up and then you, you get, you, people tend to panic and, you know, think I'm missing something in life or what's going yeah. on. I'm about to die. And then they go into this sort of weird animal mode where they do dumb crap um, most of the time. And then sometimes they change some things that they're doing in their life and it's for the good. But yeah, yeah. we don't, we just don't face the reality of our mortality very much. Um, and that's not a problem for the people that I love studying in history. Like these guys, they face their mortality all the yeah. time. And, and and like you said, they did you know, they did it from day one, really. It was it was very close to them. They would see these things that it's also related to, I believe, in having big families. Hmm. Because if you have big families, you're consistently seeing that, like, you know, you're consistently seeing life and death within your own family. Like it's not something that's happening to someone else. I mean, even like for me, I grew up with there's me and my sister. Uh, and my mom and I, I had a grandmother I had a, a grandmother and grandfather on the one side that I, that I saw every day and then my um, aunts but my mom was one of five my grandmother was one of I think like seven and, and then as you go about there's more and more and more so you would be you know 10 11 12 13 14 you know even into your your late teens, maybe even early twenties, and you'd have a brother born or a sister born. And then you'd have to, you'd, you'd see that. And that it's, it's kind of, I guess, and this is me just, you know, spitballing. When you see someone else's child, hmm. it's not the same as seeing a child that is your brother that has come from the same parents that is kind of a reflection of, your existence, like this happened to you with these people. And it kind of, you know what I'm saying, Michael? It kind of yeah. like puts things into perspective. Right. And then you, as you, as, it means sorry, something. Go on. It means something. That's it. There's a visceral quality to that reality of new life, especially new life that's connected to you um, that uh, that makes an impact. And it, and it gets beyond all the silly things that we spend our day with uh, worrying about. Uh, they're just there are just some things in life that are deeper and more meaningful uh, than than what we spend eighty percent ninety percent of our day dealing with and um and i I fear that we've become averse to that as a culture. We don't even want to face some of those deep things um or if we do face them, we don't know how to face them and so um with the exception i mean there are exceptions but but they're yeah. Well, less before this goes into a a, a, di a no, I don't. I, I, I think it's important a though. A different no, uh, I, th track I think it's important though. I do, I do because because I think the reason why people respond to this so viscerally is, I mean, number one, people love history, right? They they really do, and I think that history has had a bad rap at schools. The, the, I hated history that when is I the was truth. at school. It's the most. I hated it, history. It's the most. It is. 
without a doubt, the most boring subject, if you, uh, according to polls of any, so like even math is, math is more hated than history across the board because of its difficulty, but it's as it, I'm speaking as a former teacher. So I, for many years, I taught <laughs> high school um, when I was younger, much younger, but, uh, but yeah, math is more hated on a, but, but people ha have a visceral hatred of math. People just hate history the way that that you hate the dmv it's just it just it just wants to kill you um with its boredom and so <laughs> you're you're just the, and, and that's simply not true of course like real history yeah. when when told properly or when you start learning enough detail to fill out the and flesh out the characters and it's fascinating and awesome but uh, you know i'm but i think i'm a little biased on that no no but i think that when you have a real reflection on your life. This is, this is where I'm going with it, right? Like when you have a real reflection on your life and uh, we've seen it a lot in recent years that people do not want to be wrong, right? They're more married to not being wrong than they are worried about being wrong. Right. Right. If, if, if that makes any sense, right? You know, that they're like, no, 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 because I made a decision. And if I made a decision, and then if it is wrong, then I've got to examine why it's wrong. I, I right? don't, I don't and, think and they that, have the tools to do it most of the time. They or, yeah, they don't. They don't want to because they haven't had to confront it. Now, for me, and I think for a lot of Gen Xers, we're like, I do not want to get it wrong. Like, I want to make sure that I know the truth, right? I want to make sure that I'm on the right path and, and I'll pursue that wherever it takes me. And it's a very, very uncomfortable place to be. But uh, and I think that perhaps this is people recognize when they when they look at these actions and behaviors of people in history, and they go, why? Like, why would you do that? And then you kind of, I just think it's a it's it's a really normal, natural thing to do. And I think we dull it down mm. with things like, I'm going to go and have an affair or I'm going to go and buy a Harley Davidson or I'm going to get a Corvette at 60 and I'm going to, you know, do this and that. Again, it's just gloss. It's just fluff, right? Because nobody ever goes, oh, okay, I did that and I'm really happy now. Like that really, <laughs> you know, right. that really scratched that itch. I, I, I feel fantastic now. But I think these, mm -hmm. we are looking now at these great moments and saying these people really had purpose. And, uh, and also, Michael, when you have feckless, corrupt leaders and, and you're, being, you're getting into situations that you know you shouldn't be getting into and you're fighting things that you really don't believe in because all these, this wasn't a, you went on these crusades if you really believed that it, it was a, a good cause. Now, you join the military and you have to follow your orders wherever it is. And I think in, in very, very recent history, I know there's, there's always been a tradition, right, of people going, well, you know, why are we in Vietnam and why we... But recently, more than ever, people are going, hang on a minute. Like, what is this all about? Like, why am I doing this? So, so that warrior class, which, you know, is alive and well, it really is alive and well. They're the people that I love being around the most. And that's what I was saying earlier yep. on about, about, um, you can always, you can tell from your posters behind you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cause I pretend I'm a good pretender, but, um, I love, you know, that I love being around veterans. I love being around war fighters. They're my people. Exactly. Um, but, and again, I, you know, just going back to what I said at the beginning, I wasn't trying to say that, like, you know, you're stupid if you, you know, if you join the military. I was trying to say is, like, if you really, really think about it, when you get older, you're not going to do that, right? You're not going to go and, as a, as a 50 year old man, you're going to be like, hang on a minute, like, I'm not going to go away. And, you know, I know the chances of me and, dying are really And very high, often high. you have other responsibilities too, that it would be actually, it, it, would, it would actually, in some cases, it would actually be irresponsible for you to do those. So unless it was actually required to save the people that- Yeah, you, you had to. Mm -hmm. But but look, I mean, you know, we, we've had, we've got young boys, right? They're invincible according to them, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's- 
that's the mentality, right? Like you say, I think as you get older, you kind of go, well, maybe I'm not invincible. You know, maybe you get into a car wreck and it puts you back out for six months and you're like, hang on a second, this is real life, yep. right? And I think that the, 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 the soldiers that I know, um, you know, they, they have that bravery, but then they'll come up, come up against something like this and it does make them aware of their mortality more. Yes. Uh, it's, it's only natural. But I think that we we don't have the purpose in our lives anymore. I say we, like, you know, I'm talking like a worldwide thing, actually. Uh, well, certainly the Western world. Be right. Because what, what do we stand up for anymore? What do we stand for? Well, precious little sometimes. Like our own selfishness. We, we just stand for whatever the trend is on the, of the moment at, on TikTok or whatever political swing that there is. Now, there are plenty of people in the world that, you know, it is not an accident that the Crusades were tied, were, had a close religious t connection to them on both sides, um, both Muslim and Christian. And, and um, because it is a well-recognized historical fact that religion speaks to some of these deeper purposes that human beings feel within them and uh, act accordingly. And human beings are willing to put their lives on the line for their religious principles um, quite a bit compared to other things um, with the exception of, you know, family or something like that. Um, and so, so there's that loss of purpose that you're speaking about. It isn't universal, but as our cultures become more and more as our, as Western cultures, especially, but every, all the cultures probably become more and more separated from the grounding that they had their base of the, the true, the good, the beautiful, the things in the world that mattered, um, as expressed by their faith, as expressed by their intellect, as expressed by their deepest desires. Um, these things are, and, and um, as we become more and more unmoored from those and we seek the flashing lights and the temporary pleasure, um, then we become adrift. We just become the dandelion um, blowing on the breeze, fluff blowing on the breeze, because there, we have no roots and and we want them. We want those roots. And so sometimes when people think about things like the Crusades, that's what it's, it sparks in them. It was a time when people, yeah. people knew what, what it, what it was to stand for something right and, and voluntarily made the choice. Remember, nobody was forced to go on a crusade. It was always voluntary. Yeah. And I think Michael, that right now, you could you could also make an argument for like nationalism because no, normally the nationalism in the past has been tied to people's faith right like certainly hmm. in england it was it was nationalism you had a king for all those years and and that you know meant something uh, and in america with the the founding fathers that meant something you know the constitution meant something and it stood for something and america stood for something for so very long uh when everyone else was losing it when everything else was falling away and it does worry me that we have people saying that the flag doesn't matter or that you know being proud of your country doesn't matter or that or they're actively trying to get you away from it and i think i think I never thought I'd see it in America, right? And I've seen it in America over the past like ten years, like rapidly, like like super fast. Anyone that's our age that that lived through nine eleven and saw the patriotism that came out around nine eleven, which was you know, if ever there was something good come out of a horrendous situation, it was that, you know, the the unity and and the way everyone. I remember getting off the plane and just seeing flags everywhere, and I was like, this is this is unbelievable. So the flag being like a representation of other things, right? right? Not just like the flag. Right. Um, but I think that most recently we've really, really massively moved away from any kind of purpose. And, but, but the good thing is, is we're getting a reaction to it. That there's, there's, a, there's a spring back. And it is honestly, it is incumbent on Gen X, right? It is Gen X to reach out to these kids that are like, I, I, I don't know where to go, right? This is why Jordan Peterson has people coming up to him and saying, you know, you told me to make my bed and it's changed my life. Uh, think about that. J j just think about that. 
Yeah. Would I'm taking we made our beds when we were kids. Like that was exactly. it. Like you had to do it. I get a smack around right the back of the head or you know. But but you made your bed, right? And now this is a, a revolutionary concept. I mean, and again, I'm not kind of like it's not to to be derogatory to Jordan for saying that, right? Because he's just making it. He's a master communicator that can that can put this across and has and has condensed this in in a way that he's kind of grabbed everything, right? Right? He's kind of grabbed all these different things, and he's so smart. Uh, and such a great communicator, he just puts it all in a package and goes, "There you go." And people are going, <gasps> "Yeah, I'm actually going to have fun." Uh, two weeks from this weekend, I'm going to I'm taking a couple of my kids to see. He's coming to uh, my hometown to uh, talk. So, oh great, we got we got oh, some great. T- we got I've some seen him twice. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I haven't I haven't seen him live before. I followed him for years, but uh, absolutely, he's he's one of those that is um, advocating a return to purpose. And we all know that we need it. Even those that are adrift, they all sense that they need purpose. They just don't know how to find it. I agree with you. It's Gen X's turn. The boomers have uh, taken their swing, mostly a swing and a miss. And it was kind of like this. Yeah. Yeah. It was like hiding. You know. So so it is up to us. Not much of a swing. Um, it is up to us. We're the last generation that had a uh, that had a connection to grass without the internet. And so um, when we were growing up. And so, um, you know, and we're you know, we're up next. And then after us, it'll be the millennials. And like, people have to find a return to purpose. Um, I agree with that. And I think that that's, it's a, it's always a fascinating journey. Um, but uh, purpose, what I can say for sure is there are purposes all over the place, but I can guarantee that your purpose in life isn't momentary pleasure. That's the greatest uh, lie that we've been fed in this culture is the dopamine hits and the momentary pleasures that we now think happiness lies in or so many of the young think yeah and and, in in addition to that michael uh, and you know people say and i've heard this multiple times oh you know joe rog i want to do a a podcast like joe rogan right and the response when people to people who say that for the most part because i've heard it right is they'll be like oh it's just because joe rogan's a success right no so, for example, for me, I wanted to do long form content, right? And there's a reason why I want to do long form content because I believe that people want it, right? I believe that people are desperate for it to, so to talk about the deeper things, to talk about. And look, it doesn't matter. You might disagree with it. It doesn't matter. I, I love listening to things that I disagree with. I, exactly. I want to be challenged in my. I don't want to be comfortable. So it's it's all about being uncomfortable, and that's why I, you know, like this is, you know, we're coming up to two hours. It's funny on my other videos, and I can tell the people watching this is that there's my videos have a very um, solid group of people that watch them all the way through, hmm. all the way through. They watch them from beginning to end. And I'm like, that's awesome. those are the people, that's what you want, right? These are the people that, I mean, I, I'd like other people as well, but the truth is, is you want to make something, it's very easy to go, oh, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a video about like, you know, I'm going to make deviled eggs and this is how I make that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I want it to, I want this to be a platform where people can come, they can learn things, and including I will learn things or I am learning things. Right, right. But I want it to be a forum for people to ask questions and not to be, like I said about the, the, the thing with, uh, with Jim Burnham and the, um, you know, the proof of an immaterial soul. That is a very, very heavy subject. Like yes. you are talking about, you know, Platonic, Aristotelian and all these other different uh, philosophical um, questions and Jim, by the way, was a valedictorian from Hillsdale, right? He, he's a super, super intelligent man. And the, the arguments that came the other way, I'm hoping what I would like is for for this discussion to go on, right? right? For these people that don't like what I had to say to come on the, the Q&As and let's talk it through and hopefully – Hopefully they'll engage yeah. in an in a, a mature way, right, and have a proper debate. And that's, I mean, those are the some of the more. I mean, people are grow. 
the appetite for not just long form podcasts, because you're absolutely right about Joe Rogan and um, the rise of long form podcast. He just he's just the representative of that, a representative of that, the biggest one. But um, but there's there's so many other people that do that now. And that was considered uh, back in the early aughts. That was considered a death knell in media. You were yeah. you were an idiot if you thought that people wanted to listen for longer than eight minutes to anything anyone had to say. And it turns out that um, you that opinion actually was kind of a self fulfilling prophecy because there is a large part of humanity that will not listen um, more than a couple minutes to anything, uh, which is sad. But there's also a huge part of humanity that listens quite a bit. Um, and and I it's really important to hear the other side. I hope I get some great questions too. If if people want to ask tough ones, I'm happy happy to field anything because. I love I love testing ideas and I, I'm I'm wrong about a bunch of things um I'm sure in life and I would love to correct myself. Um it but you you need to hone your mind. And the only way to hone your mind is iron sharpens iron. So you, you need to it needs to be with other people um almost always. Sometimes by reading some of the great ideas of civilization and the greatest thoughts that humanity has ever thought um in these in great books and things but oftentimes by sharpening the steel the iron of your mind against the other iron and and i i've thought for years it would be fun to have kind of a standing socratic dialogue podcast where you had you had a rotating group of people that would come in and there's things that are like this on the internet but you and, and yeah. you just take topics you take really interesting topics like the immaterial soul and and you hear you have a pseudo debate, but I don't mean pseudo like fake. I mean, um, a partial debate, but part yeah. but a Socratic dialogue where people are just introducing ideas, bouncing them off each other, challenging the other other person's ideas, testing, answering. And um, you just hear the the minds working over a problem because that sparks things in, um, in people when they listen to that. And, and, and even if they. And I've seen this, right? I've seen people shut down when you have those discussions. They shut down, boom, you know, I'm not doing it. But that seed is in there, and it, and it just keeps, like, scratching away a little bit, just, yep. just bit by bit. And I think that what I like about Joe Rogan is that he's genuinely curious. Like, this is a guy that's curious. I don't agree with him on everything, of no. course. Who cares? I mean, that would be a boring, boring. I, I mean, know. look, so so just so you guys know, uh so me and michael have known each other a long time now uh we have a group of friends that uh we we did now we kind of dispersed thank you gavin knew some of the communist state of california <laughs> but we had a you know we had a really and we still do we're still friends i'm seeing one of our other friends this weekend i've got you know another friend around the corner matt peterson who will come on the podcast and these were our discussions most friday or saturday nights right like we would we would have people around and it was, we talk about, like we I think I mentioned it before, when we'd, we'd be sitting here, we'd be talking about, you know, Matt's a PhD, you know, John Coons, you know, he's, you know, he almost finished his PhD. I, I persuaded him to go back and finish it, right? Um, Good for you. Uh, uh, yourself, uh, all different disciplines, people that have expertise in a lot of different things. And we'd have these discussions and it would range from anything like deep theology, philosophy to, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, what's got, you know, Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. It would be like, to, bang, bang, to bang, podcasts, bang, like, to poker, to the Simpsons, to whatever. It, 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 anything, anything. But it would, and, and we just let it go the way that it would go. And honestly, it was fantastic. It was so fantastic. And, you know, I didn't grow up with that kind of um, environment. And, and, and you know, not, not that it was anyone's fault. I mean, I, I go back now and actually it's funny because I go back to the UK and I'm talking to my, my sister's very much like that. We sit and talk and talk and talk about things, about the, about the big things. She, she's got a, a master's in psychology. Um, she's very, very smart. Went back years later. Um, I, I, and that has changed. That dynamic has changed. But I, I want to say to the people out here, let this be your space, right? Because you might feel kind of isolated. Maybe, maybe not, right? But you might actually find a bunch of friends on here that you're like, okay, these are my people. We can talk about these things because, you know, I would say like, I cannot do small talk. 
right? You wouldn't think it with my gob that goes like this, 24-7, like me and Mike. I <laughs> have a battle for those who's going to just keep on talking the whole time. But I don't like doing small talk because there's so many wonderful things in the world to talk about. Why won't you talk about them? And I want to know what people think, Yep. right? I mean, there's stupid stuff. That's why, you know, you talk about, you, you know, you guys who follow me on here more than likely follow me on Twitter. So you'll know sometimes I'll be like, oh, just bleepity bleep, right? I don't have time for it because what happens on, on social media is you, you start seeing patterns and you start to see the way people are. And and as I've got older, I always used to say, okay, I'm going to entertain them, right, in, in the sense that I'm going to entertain their question. I went, okay, all right, all right, okay, all right, whatever, whatever you're going to say, do you have a point, all right, do you have a point, do you have a point? <laughs> and, and as I'm going on, I'm getting more and more – frustrated with them sucking my time when I could be spending it with other people. Hmm. So, but I, I did want to make this podcast so that people could come along and express themselves. Now I, I'm, I'm also, um, you know, kind of a little bit worried about doing a live, right? Because I'm kind of, I don't know if I'm pressing the right buttons. I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll have to talk to you about it. But, um, but I think that that is a really, amazing kind of medium to get to know each other. And at the end of the day, um, I mean, look, I was a big believer before of actors. You don't need to know anything about them, right? Like who cares? Ah, uh, right. You know, go, who cares what they think about politics? Who cares what they think about, you know, anything really? Um, but I have seen, and you know this, Michael, because I've been bugged for a very, very long time to go and do this, do this medium, is that when you're in a profession when there seems to be 90% of people that talk a certain way, and what you're going to be doing is tarnishing a whole other 10% or however small it is of people out there that aren't like that. And the reason why I believe it's important is because there's a ton of kids out there that want to get into the arts and they should get into the arts. And, and if you, if parents rightly so, right, parents rightly so would say, I am never going to allow you to go into acting or screenwriting or, or whatever it might be because they're a bunch of weirdos and they are a bunch of weirdos, but some of us aren't. And that's why I keep saying that silly thing might like, not all actors are like this. I promise. I promise they're not. Right, because please don't think that way. Please don't let that stop you from having your kids come in the arts. I know you know your kids very talented. Yeah, well, I, um, I, I had the exact attitude. One of my daughters wanted to be in the arts, wanted to be in um, acting and movies, and I had that knee jerk reaction. But then I remembered that I was friends with you, so I was like, "You can take lessons with Mr. Marsden, and uh, that's that can be your because not all actors are 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 the way that I fear." So, uh, yeah, <laughs> which she, yeah, and it which was she great. loved, and it, it was it was fantastic to have you as a teacher. Well, and she she was a wonderful student, but but again, you know, you're right. I mean, you've got to keep. We're seeing it right now with what's going on in schools. You absolutely have to be very very careful with who you entrust your children to. So, but I do I do think that. Um, I get a lot of people writing to me and they're like, what do I do? What do I do? And it, and it hurts me, right? It, it genuinely does because mm. I, I grew up, it's all I wanted to do. It's all I've ever done in my life. And, you know, it was a more innocent time. Actually, it wasn't a more innocent time back then. It's just that somehow I managed to say by God's will, I managed to miss a lot of very unsavory things. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that there there have been a few actors I've heard recently talking about that how they were just lucky or by the grace of God they missed yeah. they they got missed. Um they even saw saw some things uh, happening to people around them but they never got touched which is which is I mean praise God. Yeah. Or, or maybe you know for for example for me I'm a little bit rough around the edges now and then and 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 I can handle myself. Uh so I do give off that vibe I'm not going to be a victim. Right. Um, so maybe that, that helped me, um, you know, so that, that working class rough, uh, upbringing, uh, maybe that helped me. 
not everyone like I wouldn't let my kids go down there. But anyway, I mean, I'm I'm digressing a little bit too much. But what I wanted to say is is let's let's keep the dialogue going. I love talking to you, Mike. You know, you're one of my best friends. Um, well, it'd be I fun. always learn. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always fun talking to you, Matthew, and uh, and. Or, or in this case, I guess talking at you for forty-five minutes. So sorry about that. But, but, uh, but hopefully your listeners have some fun uh, questions that we can tackle next time, and uh, maybe we can make it a live stream or or do a Q and A or something, some such. But it was it was excellent. Thank you. Thank, yeah, so, thank you as always. So thank you, Michael. Give us give us your questions. Number one, and here's another thing. I think it would be good to do it when you guys don't have to get it for work, you know, maybe on a Friday night or something. Oh, look at that. that that's funny. I did that. That um, It's magic. Maybe a Friday night and, um, and tell us a time because we're trying to, it's very difficult, right, Michael, because, you know, you're on the East coast and then I'm in Texas and then there's people in California and there's people in the UK. So let's get, let, let's try and come to a consensus where we can, we can kind of meet. Is it like, 6 p.m. Uh, well, actually, what am I talking about? Like 6 p.m. LA time, uh, which would be 8 p.m. here, 9 p.m. in on in the on the East Coast. That would not be great for people in the UK. Or do we do it? I mean, it might be more difficult of a weekend. People have got things on. Just, just give us give us an idea, um, and I'll do my best to put it out uh, at that point. I know there's a you know I went on um, Joe Good Logics. Good logic on his show, and he does one pretty late at night, in New York. It's around eleven o'clock, and he has a bunch of people turn up. So, uh, right, I, yeah. hope- I mean, there, there, there are people that will turn up. Um, one of the things we found that worked for the Exploring Tolkien podcast, we have occasional meetups um, with our subscribers and live chats, and uh, they we they work late morning on like saturday or sunday usually on sunday, ah. on sunday because then you could even get uk folks on um because they're they're it's the afternoon for them but uh yeah so so but but you know you, maybe sunday maybe a sun, sunday maybe or a sunday saturday, after church um, or yeah, yeah yeah something something along those lines will sometimes work but yeah you just got to play it by ear and see what see what uh your your uh, listeners and uh viewers would like and uh, see, what, yes. see what we can make work. But thank you we'll again, sir. We'll make it happen. Now, thank you, Michael. And as I say all the time, you know, we, we, see, we see people, we see these guys going out there flapping their gums on television, you know, or you, you know, some of these Marvel actors, some of these other people, like saying how they hate their, their audience, basically. And, but just remember, when you're looking at them, when you're looking at these raving narcissists, just think to yourself, think, think, Matt. And then just remember, not all actors are like this. Indeed. I promise.